Uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Yaroslav, yeah, and I'm studying Internet at Shopify, and I like moving things from batch to streaming a lot. Um, and uh, I've been doing this over the last few years, and today I just wanted to um, share uh, some of the things I learned. I uh, hope it's going to be useful. Right. But uh, you know, before we start, just a quick uh, reminder about the Lambda architecture. You know, this is one of the very classic uh, definitions you can find. Um, basically, about you know, ten years ago, when um, you know people came up with this idea, um, we didn't have a lot of uh, good streaming technologies, right? So, batch ruled the world. Um, batch technologies were you know very reliable, scalable. Um, and so in this kind of architecture, uh, you implement a batch layer with different batch transformations. Um, but uh, to compensate for the very high latency, because it can, you know, uh, it can run for a few hours, for example, you know, we introduce some kind of speed layer. And uh, then you combine those in various different ways. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of complexity in this kind of uh, architecture. You know, you need to come up with two different systems and maintain them separately. And then you need to reconcile. So this is quite complex. Uh, nevertheless, you know a lot of uh, companies uh, used it over the years, and it's still still in use. Um, but I think we can do better, right? And um, I also want to share some of the things uh, I saw. You know, when maybe um, this is not a full lambda architecture, but still people use batch in places where we can avoid. You know, for example, uh, maybe you have a streaming job and you write a lot of data to some kind of object store, and then occasionally, you know, you detect some bad data and you end up using a, a batch job to go and, and, and fix it. You know, maybe go back uh, in history. Um, another very common use case: uh, maybe you're writing uh, a bunch of files in object store, and uh, the small files problem is, uh, you know, very very common one to have when you sample like Spark or Presto. To query those uh, files, so you can come up with a batch job, you know, to optimize this, uh, you know, file size for you to compact those small files, and this is something that's very common as well. Or, you know, classic example, uh, historical reprocessing, like something's changing in business logic, and you need to go back in time and basically reprocess old data, right? So I, I see all those lambda incarnations, all those uh, different uh, batches cases uh, all over the place. And I think, again, we can do better. Um, so cup architecture is a very simple idea, um, right? You essentially take the Lambda architecture, you drop the batch, and uh, that, you know what, what's left is a, a cup architecture. Right? You rely on streaming quite a bit. Uh, and uh, your streaming layer uh, basically handles all the new data that's coming. You have some kind of data store where you write your results and you query the data store, right? So again, very similar, uh, just uh, really focus on streaming as a, as a first class citizen and uh, rely on streaming in all those um, interesting situations, right? And so very, very typical concerns uh, that people, uh, you know, uh, come up with when you talk about Kappa. Uh, you know, and the first one is data availability and retention, right? So maybe you use something like uh, Apache Kafka as your uh, streaming platform, and maybe you have a default seven days retention for a bunch of Kafka topics. Uh, so when the data is gone, you know, you can't really do much. You can't go back to history. Um, what do you do, right? So that, that's, a, that's a problem. Data consistency is still sometime, uh, you, you know, you can hear people say, oh, this is streaming. So you maybe expect some duplicates or even like missing data. Um, and we'll talk more about that today. Um, handle late driving data is also a very common topic, right? Um, and batch and streaming, you know, can, can, can do it differently depending on a variety of different use cases. Um, and finally, I think this is also something that's uh, very common. You know, how do you reprocess? How do you backfill data? Like if you have truly streaming system end to end, no batch whatsoever, how do you go back and like reprocess years of data potentially in a in a reliable and reasonable way, right? So all those concerns, something we want to try to address. Um, but before we continue, I just want to share you know my thoughts. Why do I like streaming so much? And um, typically, when you compare batch and streaming, people think about latency, right? And it's it's a nice one, but it's not the main goal, right? Uh, because you never know how much latency is okay. Like, uh, imagine you have this batch job that's running every twelve hours, and uh, you decide to tr transition to a streaming system, you know, uh, full kappa. 
what is enough latency or what is a, a good latency here? It's essentially between 12 hours and zero, but it can't really say what, what's fine, right? So yes, decreasing latency is good, but I don't think it's the main benefit. And uh, handling late driving data is something that uh, actually can be very simple uh, with streaming, depending on the use case. Because with batch, usually you're on some kind of incremental batch job, maybe every day, maybe every few hours. And uh, if you have late driving data, uh, the typical approach is to just wait longer, right? So maybe your daily batch starts at uh, 4 a.m. UTC and, and you allow this four hour buffer, right? And it's very common and it's not great because uh, you rarely have that guarantee that all late data will arrive in this four hour window. So occasionally it actually arrives later and then you need to go back and reprocess and how much time is it okay? Like, can they go back and reprocess many days, a week, more than that? Um, all, all those questions arise, and it's just not clear. You know, with streaming, if you, for example, have stateless transformations and you have your syncs or destinations that support updates, that's extremely easy, right? Because uh, no matter how old is the message or the event, the, the piece of data that you receive, you know, you can always shroud it to that historical, uh, you know, partition or date or whatever, like that location. Um, and it's going to be fine, right? Because uh, you can just update that historical, um, historical um, uh, record, right? With stateful transformations, it's a bit more tricky, right? Because it depends on how exactly you state, how long do you keep it? How, how do you expire it? Can you recover state somehow? And small state is general, generally fine, but uh, the larger the state becomes, it, it can be tricky. And if you have uh, you know, destinations in your data pipeline that don't support updates uh, at all, uh, so for example, you just store a lot of Porky files on S3, you know, this is not something you can easily update from a streaming job, you know, this, this depends. So we'll, we'll talk more about this as well. Uh, but I think the main reason why you would like to use streaming over batch nowadays uh, is just operations and observability and mentality around it, right? With batch, it's fine when things fail, you know, just wait another six hours and hopefully, you know, the retry drop will fix it. If not, we might retry one more time or we'll start investigating or maybe someone disabled the wrong job and because you don't really have good monitoring in place or you know, good alerts for your batch job, you know, nobody noticed. Um, and maybe you don't really have good metrics, uh, like how much metrics do you instrument for a batch job. Um, and with streaming, you know, when you use modern frameworks like Kafka Streams, Apache Flink, and you deploy it on Kubernetes, uh, you change your mentality, right? Because now you start treating those as real, like normal applications, web applications, perhaps, right, that serve real traffic. And you start thinking about uptime expectations and SLOs, and you can fully embrace all the things around, say, CD and observability, all this, uh, all these good practices, right? So I think what's important to keep in mind, it's not just latency, right? It's that mentality that uh, allows you to treat your uh, data processing applications as, uh, you know, normal applications or certain traffic, and that's quite important if you want to have, uh, you know, reliable data pipeline. So now uh, I want to cover a few different building blocks uh, that you would need for Kappa. And I'm going to focus on three key areas here. So I'm going to focus on the uh, actual log abstraction or the streaming platform, uh, in, in my case, Apache Kafka. Um, I'm going to focus on the streaming framework, uh, Flink, and just uh, share a little bit about the data syncs or destinations. And, and I'm going to uh, share a few things about uh, Iceberg, Apache Iceberg. So uh, let's start with Kafka. And the very basic building block that you might require is Kafka topic compaction. You know, this is something that's um, pretty common nowadays. Uh, people use it quite a bit. Um, and this uh, allows you to essentially compact your history in a, in a Kafka topic and only keep the latest version if you use a message key, right? So by that message key, uh, you can essentially compact all the historical updates. And this enables infinite retention. Right, so if you can use compaction, um, this allows you to keep your data in Kafka forever. And this is kind of one of the prerequisites for uh, true Kafka um, architecture. Uh, alternative approach uh, would be to uh, use Kafka tiered storage. And this is something that's still work in progress. There's a Kafka improvement proposal for that. Um, and you know, uh, in theory, this feature allows you to 
um, keep uh, hot data in Kafka and cold data in an object store like S3. But from a consumer perspective, you still interact with a single Kafka topic, and all the data movement happens in the background, right? So if you start consuming from the uh, earliest offset, uh, Kafka will know how to get the data from S3, deserialize it, send it your way, right? And um, you know that's still work in progress, uh, but uh, people have been using this topic archive pattern for years, where you simply do that yourself, right? And then either you consume from Kafka and S3 uh, sort of in parallel, have a union of two different sources, or you uh, recover data from S3 and send it to a Kafka topic and consume from there. But this also enables that infinite retention because the object store is very cheap comparing to uh, storing all the data in Kafka. So this is something you, you might need as well. Um, Kafka has introduced transactions about four years ago. Uh, so yes, this uh, syntax on the right is available to you if you want to use uh, you know, with the Kafka producer. Um, and yeah, it has been introduced quite a bit uh, ago, uh, 4.11. And with Kafka transactions, uh, you can eliminate duplicates, right? And this ensures your data consistency. Uh, those transaction, transactions um, uh, need to work uh, with the consumer itself. Like consumer will need to um, tweak a few different parameters on their site to understand, you know, if uh, if a message is fully committed or not within the transaction. And it also needs some uh, Kafka broker tuning, but uh, not that much. And you know, you, you can just start using it. Uh, it's been it's been uh, it's been uh, used for years now. Um, another very useful building block is uh, some form of data integration uh, that can bring all types of data to Kafka, right? And, and this solves this, but I don't have uh, this data in Kafka question. Um, you can use frameworks like Kafka Connect, for example, um, to bring the data in a, in a very uh, um, sort of um, unified fashion. Uh, it's important to avoid building one-off integrations because this can get messy and unmanageable very quickly. But if you use something like Kafka Connect or some other um, similar tools, you have essentially a platform for integrating Kafka with your sources, uh, but as well as syncs, right? So if you need to send data to different destinations, uh, Kafka Connect can, can help there as well. Uh, finally here, um, in order to reproduce, um, uh, sorry, in order to reprocess uh, a lot of data uh, with Kafka, you might need to have a pretty large cluster, right? That that historical reprocessing is is a tricky uh, tricky concept. And you know, uh, if you ever managed Kafka, you know that scaling Kafka is hard. Like when you increase number of brokers uh, in your cluster, it needs to do a lot of reshuffling, and it can take hours or days. So there is this idea of uh, essentially treating Kafka clusters as immutable ent entities and scaling your capacity by adding more clusters, right? Um, and uh, this is something that Netflix has done a few years ago. Um, this is pretty advanced, I would say, because you would need uh, to uh, you know, implement producers and consumers a certain way. Like they would need to discover new clusters and understand how to route data between uh, multiple uh, clusters. But if you can do it, uh, you have this elasticity now where, you know, for a big historical reprocessing, you might want to, uh, you know, add a lot of capacity, quickly go through the backlog, uh, maybe in a few hours, and shut down all the clusters you don't need. And, and that happens very quickly. So this is pretty aspirational, I would say. But if you can get it right, uh, it's going to be a huge, uh, huge benefit. So uh, now switching to the streaming engine, um, and one of the mandatory things you need uh, for any kind of complex Kafka use case is reliable and scalable state as a part of the streaming engine. And um, you know, with Apache Flink, you have access to a keyed state, which is extremely useful concept because uh, it allows you to essentially scale your state, you know, um, not forever, but to a very large amount. Uh, just because uh, all the state is partitioned by definition, right? Uh, you use some some kind of key to partition your state, and, and then you would, uh, you know, um, have that state kind of uh, distributed uh, among the workers uh, in your cluster. And checkpointing guarantees that the state is fault toler tolerant, right? It will send the uh, checkpoint data to some kind of uh, persistent object store like S3 or GCS, so you can recover from failures. And this kind of state uh, is actually not something you you know you maybe see 
everywhere, but it's used as a building block for a lot of higher level concepts. So um, the next one I want to cover is Flink exactly ones. Um, very similar to Kafka one, right? We want to have end-to-end -end exactly ones guarantees, and Flink exactly ones uh, has this um, you know function that's implemented uh, for uh, essentially you know having two-phase commit semantics. And as you can see, based on the signature, it uses some of the uh, state functionality to actually achieve that, and it combines that with the Kafka transactions, right? So it knows how to leverage Kafka transactions. It knows how to leverage internal state. And it combines those two concepts in order to provide you exactly one's delivery all, all the way, right? So you, you can uh, consume something from Kafka, transform it, produce it, and you will persist that guarantee uh, throughout the process. And what's useful about this, uh, it's actually um, pretty gen generic. And you can implement your own custom sources and syncs. Uh, to have that exactly one's uh, delivery guarantees as well. Um, Flink state management. So again, state is important. And typically, when we talk about stateful uh, streaming, you know, you uh, might want to use something like windowing aggregations joins. Uh, you know, very classic example, some kind of window uh, for your uh, computation that stores uh, state in each of the uh, segments. Um, and I think um, that. That can work really well for simple use cases, uh, but with more complex use cases, you realize that you need something like, you know, state variables, timers, and side outputs. Like those three building blocks, uh, is something that Flink provides you to create very complex and advanced workflows. Uh, like some of the uh, scenarios that we built at Shopify, you know, you can use a state as a database essentially, uh, right? Because you can manage that state um, in a very fine-grained way. Or you can even come up with workflows where you can repopulate state um, by handling later writing uh, messages. Um, again, this is something that's pretty low level, uh, and you need to embrace you know custom state variables, timers, maybe side outputs. Um, but by doing that, you actually have access to more workflows if you just uh, use, let's say, window with aggregations. Um, this is one of my favorite features: uh, Flink State Processor API. Uh, you know, with, with historical backfill, you have this challenge where, you know, you, you might need to reprocess a lot of data, a lot of historical data, when your business logic has changed and, you know, all the state that you have in your pipeline is essentially, you know, no longer valid. Um, this API actually allows you to avoid that historical processing, right? Because it gives you programmatic access to the state itself. So what you can do, instead of going and reprocessing that three years of data in Kafka, uh, you can uh, write your uh, you know little application to read the state, update exactly what you need kind of in place, and create a new safe point. And this can combine the power of batch uh, because Flink provides that API sort of as, as a batch API at the moment, and streaming. Um, so the batch can process the um, um, safe point, uh, the the state file quickly. And you can bootstrap a new streaming job, right? So you avoid that very expensive historical backfill. And this is something I think that's unique to Flink and a very, very cool feature that uh, I, I, I just love. Um, let's see. Um, so the next, uh, I just want to mention briefly about data syncs, uh, because I think it's pretty obvious that some data syncs uh, work better for streaming use cases than others. And one of the very important things you need to keep in mind is the ability to support updates and upserts, right? Because if your data destination, uh, you know, supports those uh, those features, uh, they can be uh, used for data correction, and this is extremely useful uh, in case of a um, late driving messages. And so, some of the ex typical examples, right? Pretty much any relational database can support that. Uh, some NoSQL databases like HBase or Cassandra. Uh, with all up engines, you have Pino that support, uh, supports absurds. Uh, when you have compacted Kafka topics, you can also support that update uh, per key, essentially. right? Uh, and there's also this notion of lake house object stores, which I'm going to cover um, in a second. Um, and it can be problematic for uh, you know, some all up engines like Druid or ClickHouse, where updates maybe not first class citizen, uh, not there by design. Um, Non-compacted topics uh, is also tricky, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, if you have a classic object store, um, uh, something like uh, S3 or GCS or HDFS with a lot of Parquet files which are immutable, 
can be can be very hard to go back and update that historical data, right? But uh, just to you know uh, cover that use case because it's extremely common. You know, this is how a bunch of data lakes uh, are designed. Um, I really like the idea of using this new uh, you know lake house technologies. Maybe you heard about Apache Iceberg, Delta, or Hoodie. You know, those engines they allow you to um, provide a transactional journal on top of the object store, right? So you no longer just uh, write a bunch of files to S3 to a certain location, but all those modifications, they go through that transactional journal, right? And this uh, allows updates. This allows uh, small file uh, compaction, even time traveling if you want to, right? And Flink has, uh, Iceberg has a, a Flink uh, integration uh, where it supports uh, streaming uh, updates uh, and yeah, this, this is something you can just like, not all of those technologies uh, support Flink uh, out of the box, but uh, I think this is where, where it's going. Um, so as a summary, I want to say that, you know, we try to address all those concerns for data availability and retention. We can use things like data integration and compacted topics and tiered storage to have all the data in Kafka and have it there forever or for a very long time. Uh, we can address data consistency, uh, guarantee, uh, data consistency concern with exactly once end-to-end -end delivery semantics. Uh, we can simplify late driving data handling uh, by using proper state management primitives and proper data syncs that support updates. And for data reprocessing and backfill, you know, we can either use something like uh, dynamic Kafka clusters for el elasticity, or we can use safe points and state processor API. Uh, for Flink to update that uh, data kind of in place. And just to finish, uh, I also wanted to show like a couple of use cases and how you can use those building blocks. So this is a very common architecture. Uh, you know, you have, let's say, a stateless uh, set of transformations uh, that you want to apply to some data that's coming from like little uh, ingestion API. Everything is in Kafka, and in the end, you want to route this to multiple data sources. Like maybe there's a data lake, some kind of uh, databases, search engine. Like this, this is very common, right? So if you look at the at the building blocks we covered, you can use tiered storage for keeping the data in Kafka, you know, for a very long time. You can uh, embrace exactly once delivery. Uh, you can use Kafka Connect to route and integrate data with different uh, destinations. You can use Iceberg on top of that S3 uh, data lake for uh, transactional guarantees. And uh, you can use app certs in other data syncs. Uh, and finally, whenever you need to reprocess, maybe you decide to introduce that elasticity uh, at your Kafka layer and just quickly bring those uh, large clusters. Uh, and the second use case, uh, let's say we need to apply a set of stateful transformations like joins, window and aggregations. Um, on top of the same data stream, but also another one where we consume data from a relational database, maybe something that we have in-house. Uh, and we perform some kind of analytics, and you write it to an all-up engine like uh, Pinot. Uh, in this case, again, we use tiered storage, uh, but for the relational stream, uh, we use compacted topics, uh, just because it's a very natural fit when you have a relational database as a source. Your primary keys can serve as message keys. And perhaps use something like Debezium for change data capture, right? So you capture all of that as a data stream. You use uh, Flink for transformation to use exactly once delivery um, at the Flink layer, as well as Pino. You know, it needs to uh, configure something for that. Uh, you use safe points and state processor API in order to you know backfill and reprocess uh, some historical data in place if you if you want to. And finally, Pino supports uh, upserts, so you can do that for data correction and uh, late driving data. And that's pretty much it. I am happy to answer questions. Yeah, thanks for this awesome talk. Um, I think you've covered a lot of good building blocks uh, in 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 this in in the last uh, twenty five minutes, uh, <laughs> really really impressed by 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 the depth and uh, like how you put the pieces together. Um, yeah, let's see if there's uh, if there are questions from the audience. Not yet. Um, yeah, I have a question. 
So, um, like, given all these uh, this this uh, nice building blocks uh, to like compose your architecture, uh, where do you see uh, is the biggest gap still, or what? Where do you, where where do you think or uh, is still like significant improvement possible? Uh, good question. Yeah. Um, so I, I think a couple areas, right? So the first one is. Um, you know, streaming engines and support for large state or complex state. Like I think Flink is pretty, you know, probably the most advanced out there, uh, but you definitely have some challenges if you use, use some, some other uh, engines. And even with Flink, you know, uh, it doesn't have a, a lot of support for like, let's say you have a windowing um, transformation and the window is closed and you have late driving data like kind of the, the state of the art, you just you just drop that, right? And I think some of the data pipelines would require you to somehow reprocess that, right? So maybe like reopen the window. I know it sounds tricky, but uh, I think that that feature would be really cool to essentially just handle that late writing uh, data uh, problem, you know, once, once and for all. Um, and, and the second area of improvement is that uh, data lake um, integration, right? Like what Iceberg is doing with uh, Flink integration, I think is very impressive. And uh, I think we need to see more of that and uh, hopefully more you know, engines decide to support that. So just like making sure the data can flow to all those um, you know, data lakes uh, and object stores uh, in a transactional fashion and updates and compaction and time travel uh, is supported. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the meantime, there was uh, uh, another question came in. And that's, um, are you using the absurd feature of Pinot in production? So we actually uh, uh, decided to use Apache Druid quite a bit ago. And uh, this is kind of how I learned that, um, you know, if you don't have absurds, it can be, uh, it can be a big problem. Um, but I know about some other companies that use Pinot and, and absurds. Um, like I think Stripe has presented something like that recently, so you can try to find that online. Um, yeah, like with Druid, unfortunately, you don't have uh, absurds as a functionality, so you need to come up with the system of, you know, reductions and corrections, which is quite tricky. Um, yeah, so no, not a lot of experience with Pinot myself. <laughs> 